Thank you all um, for coming today. A very warm welcome to everybody. I think we've had over 2,000 people sign up for today's webinar, which I think demonstrates the high level of uh, interest in this in this topic. So um, how are we going to structure this? Um, we're going to start off with me just giving a few minutes um, by way of a brief introduction, setting the scene essentially, before handing over to James, who will introduce Ray's, and Ella, who will then cover applying Ray's recommendations before introducing the new joint AI methods group. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So why do we need to embrace AI? Well, health-related evidence synthesis has been around for some time and is based on the core principles of rigor, transparency, and replicability through systematic methods. And the stakes are high because decisions about people's health are made on the basis of evidence synthesis. But as we know, the field faces some huge challenges, one of which is overload. Um, with thousands of health-related research articles produced each week, the sheer quantity of evidence being produced makes it difficult to keep pace and gain a true understanding of what has been done and where the gaps remain. This deluge of research presents those of us trying to identify it with a huge specificity problem. With the emphasis being on not missing relevant studies, our sensitive approach to searching means that, as one colleague put it, we're often trying to pinpoint needles in giant haystacks. Coupled with questions becoming more complex, sensitive searching is resulting often in overwhelming numbers of noise to have to sift through. And in addition to this, our ways of working, both in terms of processes and tools used to produce health evidence synthesis, are not conducive to making research as findable, or as reusable as it could be. Issues such as lack of data interoperability, poor audit trails, teams working in total isolation, all hamper the production process and lead to duplication of effort and research waste. And ultimately, important questions remain unanswered, while others are answered again and again, wasting time, money and human effort. So the largely manual process of evidence synthesis has essentially become unsustainable. Over the last three decades, we've seen a lot of change in terms of technology's role in health evidence synthesis. Artificial intelligence is an umbrella term, and it means different things to different people. In its broadest sense, perhaps we're thinking of it in terms of ways to automate tasks and activities currently performed by humans. And the aim to maximise the use of technology for this end is not new. Um, it's been the aim of groups like the International Collaboration for Automation of Systematic Reviews, or ICASAR or ICESA, for over a decade now. And thinking in these broad terms, we can see that forms of AI have been around for some time. It's had at least a 70 year plus journey, starting with things like text analytics and rule based systems, natural language processing. And then we get to machine learning, both supervised and unsupervised. And we do have some examples of successful implementation of supervised machine learning classifiers, for example, the RCT classifier. And they have had an impact and do represent a nice example of successful implementation and community uptake. But of course now we also have generative AI, which is a form of machine learning, but feels distinctive and significant enough to warrant its own bubble here. The generative AI um, has gained a huge amount of attention across the globe and in every sector. Is the excitement and the hype justified? Well, there are some obvious potential advantages. Um, so generative AI uses large language models, which have been trained on vast data sets. And these large language models are able to recognize, summarize, translate, predict, and generate text without any specific task training or with only a few instructions in the form of prompts. 
there are some obvious potential advantages, including the speed with which these models can perform tasks, which then offers the ability to scale substantially, as well as the ability to tackle tasks in the evidence synthesis process that traditional machine learning has struggled with. Essentially, LLMs, or large language models, have dramatically opened up the potential task space in which automation or semi-automation could play a role. And I haven't mentioned accuracy yet. So we talk a lot about AI needing to be as accurate as the so-called human gold standard. Implementation of AI, of course, needs to not compromise on accuracy. In fact, in certain modes of implementation, AI might even prove to be more accurate than the human-only approach. And here I just want to flag a recent study that highlights this quite well. It's a SWA, so a study within a review conducted by Gartlerner and colleagues. And instead of using the um, human-only data extraction as a gold standard, they ran a head-to-head -head comparison with blinded adjudicators to compare traditional dual human extraction with AI plus human extraction. And the results are interesting. So the AI-assisted approach had fewer incorrect extractions, so 9% versus 11%, and similar risks of major errors, 2.5% versus 2.7%. And compared to the traditional human-only method, the median time saving of 41 minutes per study. A recent paper by Lieberum and colleagues aimed to provide an overview of large language model applications in systematic review conduct in health research. It's a great paper and one of the figures in it is this one, which aims to provide um, or show the different studies evaluating the different stages within the review process. The green circles show validation studies, the gray um, are other study designs. And along the vertical or y-axis, we have the study author's conclusion, which conclusions which this team have categorized into three main classes, promising, neutral, and non-promising. And according to Lieberum and colleagues, when it comes to search, we can see a definite sort of cluster of studies um, and we can sort of see that deemed perhaps not yet promising at this stage. However, two of the most promising areas, the purple circles, uh, seem to be screening and data extraction. As with all new technology adoption, there are always challenges, and large language models present some interesting ones, such as model overfitting, algorithmic bias, black box predictions and hallucination. But in addition to these technical challenges, we also have a number of barriers to effective implementation, including, but not limited to, AI literacy, access, ethical issues such as uh, environmental impact, and the fast pace of development. And on that last point, the sort of sheer pace of development raises some important questions about how we make the most of AI in evidence synthesis. So technology has the power to both transform and to disrupt. And sometimes it can be used to improve existing processes. And I think probably the vast majority of evaluation studies coming out at the moment are looking at that. But every now and then a new technology comes along that has potential to change or disrupt the existing paradigm. So to make tasks or activities no longer needed. Where does generative AI sit on this scale? It could radically change the way we produce evidence, but there are a lot of unknowns. And so I'm going to just conclude by saying, I think we have a responsibility to use AI, but only if we can use it safely and responsibly. We'll be more effective at understanding and overcoming the challenges together, both at a methodological level and at a data level. But to do this, we need guidance, frameworks and infrastructure that enables us to learn and evolve as the technology itself learns and evolves. <laughs>